Hey everyone, it's Brian Barron, Director of Skin Care Research at Paula's Choice Skin Care, coming at you this Wednesday, February 10th, for our first YouTube live chat of February 2021. Um, the one hasn't been as much fun as I was hoping so far, but I'm, I'm optimistic, I'm optimistic. Um, had a good time last weekend. The family went to um, a town in southwest Michigan that was having their annual ice fest. Uh, it was very cold, in fact, unusually cold uh, for that area at this time of year. Um, and we just, we, well, we prepared, we bundled up, and uh, it was a lot of fun to walk around outdoors, um, you know, going inside occasionally to warm up. But um, they had all of these artists. I never got a straight answer if uh, everyone who was participating in the sculpturing was from Michigan or, or surrounding areas or what. Um, but no matter, there was just uh, a ton of talent on display where they would take these blocks of ice and using chainsaws and various other tools and heat, you know, that they would um, take a piece of ice and then uh, put a blowtorch to it in order to just partially melt it. And then they would fuse it to a colder piece, you know, to keep building out these, these sculptures. They were really fantastic. I mean, there was everything from uh, a huge um, pepperoni pizza to the Detroit Red Wings uh, symbol to Captain Caveman, for those of you old enough to remember that cartoon show. Uh, it was really just kind of fascinating to watch, and, uh, and our son loved it. So um, today's topic, I should probably mention that, is pores, all about pores. And uh, I'm going to answer some of uh, the questions that I've seen come up quite a bit. We're going to talk about um, how to keep your, why do pores become clogged? How to keep that from happening? Uh, can you shrink your pores? What do we do about enlarged pores? Um, and what is the difference between sebaceous filaments and blackheads? Because they both have to do with you guessed it, the pores. So let me get started. I put together some notes um, to share with y'all, and then I will take your questions. Would love to hear what's on your mind about uh, any poor concerns that you're having, uh, or just skincare in general, whatever is on your mind. So pores are the opening of a, a larger unit called the pilosebaceous unit, and that every pore. Uh, uh, has that, uh, and it houses the hair follicle, the hair itself, uh, at the end of the pilosebaceous unit, or I should say attached to the pilosebaceous unit, is a sebaceous gland, which is the individual glands uh, per pore that produce sebum, or our skin's oil. Uh, and then there's also a tiny muscle called the erector pili muscle that is what's responsible for that sensation, or the, not just the sensation of, but the actual physical movement of your hair. Uh, remember that the, another, another way to think of the pilosebaceous unit is a hair follicle, uh, and those hairs can all stand on end because of this tiny muscle that is also part of the pilosebaceous unit. So uh, that happens uh, due to certain stimuli. Um, you know, for example, when you get a when you get a shiver when you're watching a scary movie, something like that. Actually, I'm going to. I'm getting ping, ping, ping. From more Microsoft Teams, so I'm going to quiet that down. I'm going to quit out of Teams. Sorry, guys. I'll have to check on you later. <laughs> so, the pilosebaceous unit is what we commonly think of as a facial pore, but we actually have two types of pores. There's the kind that the oil flows through and the kind that sweat flows through. The, the sweat pores are very, very small. Um, they're really not visible to the naked eye. They're, they're just too tiny. Um, and even when, when a dermatologist does an exam and if the patient is presenting with something that may have to do with um, blocked sweat ducts uh, or things like that, they, they have to use um, magnifying glasses or a lens of some sort to really be able to see those sweat pores. But those are all over our body and they're responsible for helping to maintain a normal body temperature um, through the act of, of sweating, which, which cools us down, even though it's the irony. So we, we sweat when we're hot. So we tend to perceive like when you're in the moment of sweating, like, 
oh, sweat is just, you know, it's hot, but it's actually a physiologic response to the body cooling you down, keep, trying to keep your temperature within the normal range. Oil pores are present all over the body except for the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet. You can imagine if, uh, for example, the bottoms of your feet got as oily as, as your nose, uh, walking around barefoot would become quite dangerous very fast. You know, you'd be slipping and sliding over any hard floor surface. Uh, you'd be cleaning your carpets all the time because there'd be this oil buildup from sebum on our feet. So it's actually a good thing for modern day life that uh, we don't have to deal with that. Um, outside the teen years, when uh, oil production really intensifies, and then for most of us, once we get out of those teen years into our early 20s, oil production normalizes. Now notice I said for most of us, some people uh, who get oily skin during your teen years will continue to have oily skin uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, I can think of some co-workers that fall into that camp, and Paula herself uh, still uh, complains of oily skin, uh, even though she is approaching age 70. But for most of us, we tend to become more aware of our pores enlarging when we are in our 40s. And that's interesting because at that kind, that decade for most of us also coincides with when we first start seeing more pronounced signs of aging. So, you know, in your 30s, you may see some of the, the forehead lines. Maybe the 11s between the brows are starting to get more noticeable. You're getting more fine lines around the eyes, but you wouldn't quite say you have wrinkles yet. And most of us in our 20s, and are definitely our 20s, and for many of us in our 30s, we're not really seeing a loss of firmness or, or signs of sagging just yet. Uh, all of those factors, though, can play a role in why our pores get larger and why, and as an offshoot of that, as a direct result of that, our pores become more noticeable in that decade. This is, um, I wouldn't say that that is a universal truth, it varies, but that number was based off of um, studies looking at thousands of women uh, in various parts of the world, and some of it was um, based on uh, self-questionnaire, and then some of it was based on um, subjective measurement and perception of pores relative to the person's age. So, kind of interesting, huh? How do you keep your pores from becoming clogged? You know, if that's, if that's and, and, but let's, let's back up a bit. Why do pores become clogged? Uh, at the top of the show, we discussed the fact that uh, a pore is another name for the pilosebaceous unit. And through that pilosebaceous unit, also known as the hair follicle, sebum from the oil gland gets secreted Meanwhile, the follicle wall, the wall of that pore, uh, has uh, skin cells, layers and layers of skin cells, and just like skin cells everywhere else in the body, those skin cells are routinely shedding. When the mechanism that governs what happens in the pilosebaceous unit uh, is working properly, you're going to get that nice flow of oil, the skin cells are going to shed normally, they're going to get mixed in with the oil, but not so much that a clog forms and they'll go nicely to the surface where they will disperse, the, the oil disperses and the dead skin cells the dead skin cells will naturally shed off. And it's, that, that is, it's imperceptible. You're not going to be sitting around watching something on Netflix and all of a sudden there go all your skin cells. You just don't see it happening. Um, but ideally, that is what happens when the pore is working normally. There are also um, very tiny hairs that line that, that follicle. And those hairs, just like the hair on our, hairs on our head, go through a resting phase and a shedding phase and whatnot, so do the hairs in the pilosebaceous unit. And so they, those tiny little hairs and other cellular debris, uh, not to mention things that we put on our skin that may have penetrated that far into the pore lining and potentially gotten stuck, all of that can, for quite a few of us, build up. Uh, into a much thicker, much harder to move um, mass than what would normally be happening. And that, that is what sets the stage and, and leads to a clogged pore, which you may see as a closed comedone, which would be the pore, you'll see the, the bump, the, 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 the clog comes to a bumpy surface, but it's covered with a thin layer of skin. Or you may see what's called an open comedone, 
otherwise known as a blackhead. So that is a clog that is not covered with a thin layer of skin at the pore opening, uh, and therefore that oil mixture oxidizes and darkens, and there you have a visible blackhead. So how do you stop this from happening? For some of us, it happens just because of genetic tendency. Uh, for some of us, it can happen because of uh, lifestyle, uh, lifestyle factors, including uh, environmental damage, too much sun exposure, tanning, uh, all, all of those can, can play a role, but mostly, mostly it's genetics followed by the use of products that are not right for your skin type, that are a bit too heavy, too clogging, and then not knowing what you can use or what you should be using to keep your pores from becoming clogged. And that involves the following. I would, for, for any, no matter your skin type, because even people with dry skin can be dealing with clogged pores. It's far more common in combination to oily skin types simply because of the large role that sebum, our skin's oil, plays in the clog process. But you need to wash your face twice daily with a gentle water-soluble cleanser that's appropriate for your skin type. And of course, it can be a texture that you prefer. Maybe you like a gel, a lotion, a cream, a balm, whatever. The point is that you do it twice daily. Uh, avoid heavy emollient products, uh, and that means if you have dry skin, when you would normally be uh, naturally drawn to creams or balm type moisturizers, you really, if you're, if you've got clogging problems, poor problems, you want to look to uh, lighter weight products and you may need to use several of them and layer them. So for example, rather than using a creamy moisturizer at night, after you wash your face, you would apply a hydrating toner and then a lightweight water-based serum, and then maybe a water-based booster product on top of that, uh, depending on what your other concerns are, and then you would finish with a lighter weight lotion uh, or gel textured or cream gel textured moisturizer, rather than something that is, is so thick that it just kind of sits there. Um, you want to avoid saturated oils and products that contain them. The, the two big saturated oils that show up in skincare products are coconut oil and palm kernel oil. Those oils, uh, if they get far enough into the pore lining, they do run the risk of hardening, uh, although that's generally a difficult process given uh, average, the, the average body temperature of, of people. Uh, but it, it can happen and it can build up over time, so you want to just watch out for those particular oils. Um, you want to make sure that you are routinely using a leave-on exfoliant, per particularly beta hydroxy acid, which is salicylic acid, that particular ingredient is oil soluble. And that is what you want so that it can penetrate further into the pore lining. Uh, it helps to break up clogs. It helps to thin oil that has become too thick, thereby reducing the risk that the oil is going to keep getting backed up in the pore. Uh, and it can help restore a normal flow of oil out of the pore because it's also uh, exfoliating or helping those dead skin cells to shed properly. Uh, so a, a leave-on BHA exfoliant that you use at least once daily. Some may find better results using it twice daily. I recommend if you are uh, clog prone using a 2% salicylic acid formula. And again, texture is really based on personal preference. Paula's Choice, we're kind of the BHA, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> the, the BHA leaders. I'll just say it. We are the BHA leaders. Nobody offers more BHA choices for your face than, than we do. Uh, so, you know, you can choose choose whichever one uh, texture you prefer. They're all going to do the same basic thing around exfoliating and helping to improve clogged pores, among other benefits. You can also consider occasional higher strength peels, and this is where AHAs can come into play. There isn't I did not actually find any research showing that ongoing use of lower strength, like 5 to 8% of glycolic or lactic acid, has much benefit for clogged pores. Maybe it'll help a little bit. It'll definitely smooth surface texture, definitely help boost hydration, um, refine any rough spots, things like that. But because the AHAs, glycolic, lact lactic, mandelic, um, tartaric, malic, 
those are the big ones, but glycolic and lactic for sure have the most research behind them. Um, they are water soluble. So if what you're dealing with, they, they, they can get into the pore to a certain degree, but when they hit that blockage of oil, they're not going to be able to do too much. That's where salicylic acid just trumps AHAs because that salicylic acid says, oh, oil, you don't fool me. I'm just going to keep, you know, going. I can, I can get right through you. I can, I can pass. Uh, where the AHAs kind of get to, to a certain point and they, they, they stop. Not that they're not going to benefit your skin in any other way, but in terms of resolving clogged pores, they're just not the best bet. However, the research shouldn't necessarily explain why this is the case. It could be because the higher concentrations that I'm about to talk about result in faster and slightly better penetration, but AHA peels between 25 and 30 percent, some studies looked at a 40 percent concentration of glycolic acid, have actually shown uh, a notable improvement in pore size and the tendency to clog. Now, if you want, you could do something at home rather than going to a med spa or a derms office. We have our skin perfecting 25 percent AHA and 2 percent BHA peel. Um, that a lot of people are, are really loving. I'm still marveling at how many people are just giving this five stars and um, have nothing negative to say about it. Because <laughs> there's, there's always people that don't like something, right? Um, and I would never say that any of our products are perfect for everybody. Uh, there's always going to be, you know, outliers who for whatever reason, something just doesn't work or they don't like it or it doesn't work with the rest of what they use. But that is something to keep in mind if you find that your clogged pores aren't responding as well as you would like them to, uh, to uh, and you're using a lower strength exfoliant, whether it's a BHA or AHA, again, I recommend BHA for clogged pores. Um, but oddly enough, the research is showing that the higher strength peels, the kind that you would leave on um, for a brief period of time, and then either rinse or often in a uh, medical setting, the peel is neutralized. The person doing the procedure will um, paint something, typically uh, another solution of a higher pH that stops the action of the peel. Um, but they can also just, you know, take a damp washcloth and gently remove it. That, that works too. Uh, we talked about that. So the excess sebum along with sun damage, uh, age is in the passage of time, uh, and the loss of elasticity coupled with the buildup of dead skin cells and debris in the pore lining and hair follicle volume changes. The volume of the hair follicle itself can change over time. It's multifactorial. That is why most people who are struggling with enlarged pores won't find uh, the ideal solution in a single product. It, it's about the combination of products used consistently that has been shown to produce really impressive results. Uh, although, the, again, the, it's interesting how little research there is on enlarged pores versus wrinkles, versus acne, versus rosacea, versus dark, dark spots, numerous other skin concerns. Uh, there just isn't a whole lot to go on in terms of enlarged pores. But what we know you can do, along with the BHA I mentioned, is you, you can use a leave-on product that contains niacinamide, and you want to look for uh, amounts of 5% or greater, maybe 3% depending on the formula. And if you're kind of new to niacinamide and you're a little concerned about how your skin might respond to it, you could start with a lower concentration. But niacinamide... Uh, they're n it's not definitive in how it works uh, to improve pore size, but it's believed to have a positive effect on the shape of the pore lining, uh, which can in turn have a, a trickle-down effect in helping to make everything else about how the pore works more efficient, thereby taking the size of a once enlarged pore down to its normal size. Um, you cannot shrink your pores past what's considered their genetically predetermined size. Um, some people just naturally have larger pores. Most of us have larger pores in the central portion of our face. Coincidentally, that is where we have the most oil glands, and the oil glands in this area also tend to be larger, a little bit larger, and more active than oil glands elsewhere on the body. 
Uh, that's why you can look at the top of your arm or even your chest where we absolutely have pores but they don't they don't look as apparent they you know they they, they may not have that orange peel texture um, you know under a under a high um, magnific magnification microscope so like if you're looking at the surface of your skin at maybe 50x 50 times what normal human eyesight would be able to see the the surface and when you look at when you look at the pore it's almost like looking at a golf ball and and the, you know how a golf ball has those little divots that's very much like what a cross or our, our image of human skin magnified that much looks like. Um, it's kind of interesting. It's not, you know, we even like right now, it's like I can feel my skin and say, oh, it's nice and smooth. But up close, there's all kinds of little ridges just because of the natural shape of the pore. So I mentioned BHA. I mentioned niacinamide. I also, of course, want to give a shout out to retinoids. Uh, retinoids don't necessarily, again, <sighs> retinoids kind of have an indirect effect for enlarged pores and that because as cell communicating ingredients, they can directly influence how new skin cells are made and how those, cell, how those cells differentiate as they make their way through from the base layer of skin, the dermis, uh, through the various layers of the epidermis and finally to the surface where what, what was once a round living cell has become a flattened dead uh, keratinocyte. And then I believe, if I'm, not, if I'm not mistaken, once it gets to the surface, it's considered a corneocyte. As in, a corneocyte, to get a little bit geeky here, would be a fully differentiated keratinocyte, meaning it's at the end of its life cycle, it's done its thing, it's going to hang out on the surface for a bit, maybe have a drink or two, and then it jumps ship. However, if you're prone to clogged pores, that corneocyte, little dead skin cell, may not be jumping ship after a couple of drinks. It might just go back into the pore and just no, it, it, not necessarily go back into the pore, but it may not even make it to the surface because it gets stuck. It's not what's happening inside the pore lining isn't letting that skin cell move through properly. And that is where retinoids, both over-the-counter retinol, derivatives like retinaldehyde, retinyl retinoate, hydroxypenicolone retinoate, and any of the prescription forms, the research has specifically looked at, at least that, that I was able to come across, has looked at tazerotene, which uh, is brand name Tazerac, and then tretinoin, big surprise, uh, that's available as a generic, but uh, was uh, known for years as Retin-A as well as Renova. Those are the two prescription forms of retinoids that have direct research relating to their ability to help improve enlarged pores. I did not find the same for adapalene, which is different. Uh, that seems to have uh, just a, a better overall effect on reducing acne, the lesion count, the severity of acne, and the inflammation that occurs uh, in the pilosebaceous unit, which is all good. Um, but if you are not dealing with acne and you're dealing with enlarged clogged pores, uh, or just at large pores, and you're looking at prescription retinoids, you need to know which ones have the good research behind them, and that would be Tazerac to Zerotene. I don't think that's available as a generic, uh, or Tretinoin. So either one would, would, would be fine. Uh, as would OTC retinol, and there isn't a consensus on concentration that works best. Uh, however, if you feel that your pores are um, definitely enlarged, you know, because of age, because of sun damage, uh, and you've always had that tendency to have clogged pores, if it were me, I would go for at least half percent retinol uh, or look to something like our clinical retinol Bacuchiol product because you're getting 0.3% retinol, but then the 2% Bacuchiol kicks in and delivers many of the same benefits as retinol. So it's kind of like you're getting a, a stronger retinol product, but it's not, uh, not direct retinol. It's another ingredient that has many of the same benefits for skin and for pores as retinol itself. Next up would be to consider, uh, and this is more of a cosmetic thing, uh, mattifying products. Products, if, if you can keep your skin looking matte, shiny skin and large pores don't go together. You know, you put, put a, a shiny finished product over areas where you have large pores and what, what do you see? Those pores seem a lot bigger. Reason being is because those pores are absorbing the light rather than reflecting it like a completely smooth surface would, like an iced over lake, for example. 
um, where you can almost like see a mirror image of the sky above. The um, mattify, anything you can do to, to mattify your skin, and uh, an example from Paula's Choice that I love is, is Shine Stopper. That's a personal favorite of mine. Uh, and it not only uh, instantly mattifies the skin and helps control excess surface oil uh, from getting out of hand, but it also has a slight blurring effect on the pores that I would, I would relate to uh, a putting, putting powder on, which is another option in the makeup department that would also help to blur pores, as would uh, choosing a matte finish foundation. Doesn't necessarily have to be oil free as well. I would just make sure that the amount of oil is toward the bottom third of the ingredient list. It shouldn't feel uh, creamy and really moisturizing. It should uh, feel relatively light, silky. It should be water based and have a nice matte finish. Uh, you can also look at absorbent masks, any type of, of uh, non irritating clay. There isn't a best clay. Uh, some would say that uh, a mask with uh, blends of different clays may produce better results because of the different absorbent qualities that they have and how that can work together. Uh, charcoal masks with clay are, are also fine and you can use those two, three, even four times a week, uh, morning or evening, your choice. Just you know, put them on skin that doesn't have anything else on it, then rinse and then proceed with the rest of your morning or evening routine. If your enlarged pores are really, really stubborn and they're just bothering you to no end, there are a couple of other non-skincare options you can consider. The research around what I'm about to suggest isn't prodigious. However, it's out there uh, and for the most part, particularly with the second thing I'm going to mention, um, studies have shown as much as a 51% improvement uh, in the the look of enlarged pores and and uh, just to a lesser degree their tendency to clog, which is which is good. That that's pretty impressive. Um, the first one is oral medications, uh, particularly if you are a woman, uh, you can talk to your doctor about taking um, anti-androgen medications. Uh, that's a trickier uh, recommendation for men because uh, you you. you Androgens are, prime. women have androgens, men have androgens, just like men have estrogen and women have estrogen. But between those two biologic genders, the hormone ratio is, is reversed. Men have more testosterone, women have more estrogen. Some women have uh, an excess of testosterone, which is an androgen hormone or other androgens. So it's also worth talking to your doctor about getting a blood test just to get a baseline hormone level so you know what you're dealing, you and your doctor know what you're dealing with. And then if your hormone levels are out of whack, your doctor can prescribe hormone lowering medications that you would take by mouth. Um, and it's, it's worth the discussion. Uh, another option for women would be that some oral contraceptives like spironolactone have shown some improvement in enlarged pores. I don't, I mean, given the side effects, you want to weigh both of those options carefully. You just want to be aware of what you're dealing with. Um, if you are on birth control anyway of some form and you haven't considered that option and you're also dealing with enlarged clogged pores, it's worth, I think it's worth the discussion. You know, maybe you decide not to do it, but have that talk with your doctor. The other option is in-office laser or light emitting treatments uh, along with uh, ultrasound treatments where they, the ultrasound research looked at improvement after using a three millimeter transducer. Uh, the transducer is the device that pushes those ultrasound uh, uh, waves through the skin. Um, uh, the procedure name tends to be all therapy. Uh, but it can go by different names. In terms of laser and light emitting treatment, the non-ablative 1410 nanometer fractionated erbium doped fiber laser. <laughs> you don't have to remember all of that, but if you're talking to uh, someone at a, at a med spa or a dermatologist's office about lasers and light emitting treatments for pores, just remember the 1410 part uh, because they, they'll likely have different devices that they'll talk to you about and, and that the 1410 nanometer fractionated uh, which means that it, it is more of a grid pattern wounding of the skin so to speak as opposed to classic ablative resurfacing that just kind of vaporizes that whole layer 
all at once. The fractionated, uh, it, it injures the skin in a grid-like pattern. Uh, and again, it's, it's a controlled injury of the skin. Um, and it leaves, so you've got the out, picture the, like a tic-tac-toe pattern. The outline of the pattern is what the laser hits. And then everything that's in the squares doesn't get affected by it. So you've got, you know, injured skin surrounded by healthy skin. Uh, and that is why fractionated laser technology has become the, the de facto choice for so many different concerns because I'm not going to, I've had it done myself. I'm not going to say it isn't um, painful and they will numb you. Um, but you, there, there's pretty much no downtime. You're not, you're not an oozing crusty mess that, you know, has to hide yourself from public view for 14 days. And there's good studies, um, not a whole lot, but fairly good studies looking at uh, a notable improvement in pore size. Um, I wanted to mention, I mentioned orange peel texture a moment ago, and I wanted to also mention that um, essentially what happens and why sun damage is a factor in why pores become enlarged with age and why sunscreen is an important part of your pore reducing routine. It should just be part of everybody's daily routine, but I always like mentioning it because so much about what we don't like about our skin comes down to cumulative sun damage. And that includes pores because what happens over time is that that UV light exposure damages and causes the collagen and elastin support structure to break down. That is right beneath I mean, not literally right beneath, but it's, you know, that that is what is keeping your skin where you want it to be as that uh, scaffolding starts to break down. And then with advancing years, we also start losing bone. Uh, gravity starts taking its toll. All of that causes our skin to start doing this, going down. And with that stretching of the skin, the pore can become stretched too. So what was once a, uh, a firmer plump circle kind of takes on more of a teardrop shape because the bottom portion of the pore that is you know is sagging that sagging the most it that that pole changes the shape of the pore uh, the elasticity what what actually happens beneath the surface is that there is a uh, a microfiber type uh, ingredient called glycoprotein 1 or magp1 that, uh, that is a, a crucial component of uh, your skin's elasticity network. And when that expression starts going down because of environmental damage, your, your skin could still be producing healthy elastin, but it's not really knowing how to put it all together anymore. And that too can contribute to it. So it's just one more reason to put that SPF on every morning. Okay, really quick, we talked about pore shrinking. Okay. I am going to get to your questions, I promise. I wanted to touch on um, sebaceous filaments and the difference between them and blackheads. So blackheads form when a buildup of the sebum, the dead skin cells, and the tiny hairs makes its way to the skin surface that cannot fully escape. Uh, it's that the clog has kind of reached the, the opening, the pore, uh, and rather than distributing evenly on the surface of the skin, it's just backed up. It can't really go anywhere. But that mixture of sebum and other debris, once it hits the air and it's open to the air, open comedone, closed comedone has got that layer of skin over it so you don't see a blackhead, that mixture oxidizes and turns dark. A huge difference between sebaceous filaments and blackheads is that blackheads are not a natural characteristic of skin. They are a, a byproduct of, uh, of skin's, um, the function of the pore that's gone haywire for any number of reasons. Um, unlike sebaceous filaments, blackheads can be controlled with ongoing use of a leave-on exfoliant. That's you know first and foremost. You can also consider higher strength peel type products either at home or from your dermatologist. The you can remove a sebaceous filament, as many of you uh, have have discovered. You know you can kind of manipulate it out and. You know, and, and sometimes those do have a, a black tip. So they, they are easily confused with blackheads. But a sebaceous filament is actually uh, a normal part of the pore lining uh, for, for most people. Some people, the, the, more, the more sebum you have, 
the more sebaceous filaments are going to be visible uh, and then the less sebum you have, the sebaceous filaments are much smaller. You probably never notice them. You may not even know what the heck I'm talking about. But uh, they are cylindrical tubes that are whitish, yellowish in color, and uh, they are most uh, obvious in areas of skin that have a lot of oil glands, particularly the central part of the face and the nose. They're actually composed, the sebaceous filament has a little skeleton around it that's composed of between 10 and 30 layers uh, of, of skin cells. Uh, and then it also includes lipids, bacteria, uh, and then uh, one hair as well. <laughs> Um, man, you can, as I mentioned, you can manually remove the sebaceous filament. It is possible, and and yes, it can be a bit gross, um, you know, depending on your tolerance for those things. But um, I have a feeling that's what my esthetician is doing when she does extractions, but she won't tell me. Um, but that's fine. I she's not messing. My my pores look better when I leave. So. <laughs> um, you can remove a sebaceous filament. Yes, it's true, but they will be back naturally within about 30 days. They are just, again, they, they are, for, for many people, and the more oil you have, the more this is an issue. They're just a natural part of the pore lining, and they will come back. Just like, you know, you pluck a hair out from a follicle that is still active and hasn't shrunk and gone dormant, you'll, you'll, you'll get hair. It'll start growing there again. That's, that's just what the body does. So, all right, I'm going to close that out. Do, 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 do. And let's get to your questions for the last 25 minutes or so that we have together this hour. All right, starting with Alex. He says, hello, he wants to know, can he use the PC body and face sunscreen? I'm assuming you're talking about the extra care. That's the only one we have for the body, and you can use it on the face. That's SPF 50. So can you use that and a mineral-based sunscreen like the one from Drunk Elephant, I feel like I need more protection as the only SPF I put on is the sunscreen from PC. I, uh, I love that you're even asking this question and worried about this because too few people are. And sun protection is very important to skin health. Um, as I've said numerous times, um, I know you guys know this. So yes, you, it's, it's fine to layer sunscreens. Many people do this. I do it. Uh, depending on how long I'm going to be outdoors and where in the world I am, uh, I, th I, I, do I, I always think it's better to go out, and especially in intense sun, with more protection on your skin than you think you may need. And in the case of intense sun, in my situation, I would also wear larger sunglasses that have the wraparound frame style so light isn't coming in through here, here, and here, um, which is important for your eye health. Uh, not to mention the skin around your eyes. Um, and then I'll also wear a broad brimmed hat that has like a two or three inch brim. So you're getting this nice shade effect, making sure the back of your neck is protected. That's an area a lot of people miss with sunscreen. Uh, I've, I've been guilty of it. And then you're outside for several hours and later that night, you're like, why is the back of my neck so sore? And you're like, oh, I got a sunburn. You know, the rest of you, no color change, missed back here. Ouch. So yes, it is totally fine to do that. And then you also asked about, uh, should you still use the PC sunscreen around your eyes, even if it stings a little sometimes? Um, that That is a tolerance thing. Ideally, a sunscreen you use around the eye shouldn't sting. I, I would rather you find, and presumably the drunk elephant option would not sting because it is a pure mineral formula. And those are the gentlest to use around the eyes. So what you could do is just use the Drunk Elephant product um, as your eye area sunscreen, even if you have to apply a bit more of that than you would when you layer it over our sunscreen. So experiment with that, see what you think. But yes, as a general rule, the mineral sunscreen actives of titanium dioxide and zinc oxide are inert. <laughs> They're very unlikely to cause irritation around the eye. They, they could cause irritation uh, or so it could be something else in the formula if they get into the eye itself, but just, you know, take care that that doesn't happen as much as possible. The King says, hi, Brian, nice to see you. A question about retinol. Do I need to wait when I apply retinol and then go with moisturizer after? You do not. Uh, and if you need to wait, how long? Oh, well, you don't. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, it, it, it will get to where it needs to go. It, it, will still, it will still work. There was um, 
the advice years ago, um, back when I was using uh, original Retin-A for acne, was that you um, wait 20 minutes um, after washing your face before you apply the tretinoin, and then you only apply a very small layer. And then, I, if I'm not mistaken, the directions and indicated you could apply moisturizer afterwards, um, immediately afterwards. But you had to wait after washing your face because what they recommended you wash your face with was bar soap. So not only was that needlessly drying and alkaline, so it really kind of threw your skin's naturally acidic pH for a loop, um, but you that's about how long it takes from a classic bar soap, uh, again, very alkaline, and skin is naturally acidic, that soap uh, breaks down what's called skin's acid mantle. And it takes about 20 to 30 minutes, sometimes even longer, for that acid mantle to reestablish itself. And so the instructions were so that you didn't put the tretinoin on too soon after washing your face before that acid mantle had time to reestablish itself because that in turn would make the tretinoin um, much more difficult to tolerate. Balthazar says, Do, does any of the supporting ingredients in the PC 20% niacinamide booster help in the pore reducing effect? Uh, yes, to a certain degree, um, we specifically chose the um, meadow sweet extract and I don't think that we, that, let me, uh, let me pull it up real quick. Do, 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 nice, um, we don't list it as Meadow Sweet. It's listed by its Latin name on the ingredients. And it is, it's like, there's a licorice, uh, Spirea al Maria. Oh, we do put in parentheses Meadow Sweet extract. So um, there's, and then the Camellia japonica flower helps as well, and they both help because they have an inhibitory effect on excess sebum. And the meadow sweet in particular uh, has the ability to reduce uh, one of the factors in skin that causes um, the oil gland to produce more oil than what is necessary. So those are kind of like indirectly supporting the means to make pores smaller. Uh, the niacinamide is believed to be not only kicking in benefit in terms of um, the uh, pore, the overall pore shape, you know, from the top down, but also uh, research has shown that niacinamide has a uh, balancing effect on oil. Uh, and what that means is that uh, niacinamide is believed to help improve the quality of oil. Some of us have poor quality oil. It's not as... Um, it's not as fluid as it should be, and it tends to thicken easily. Uh, and the thicker that sebum is, the more likely it will be thicker, sticky, the more likely it is to grab those dead skin cells and the tiny hairs and form a clog. So uh, that is one of the reasons that niacinamide can be so effective for oily skin and large pores, is that it also helps your skin's oil to uh, basically be of higher quality in terms of its balance of fatty acids. And that will have trickle-down benefits. Okay, we did that one. Uh, yep, so yeah, King, just to re uh, circle back on your question, you can put your moisturizer on immediately after your retinol product. Um, I tend to finish my routine at night with our retinol product, the clinical 0.3%, 2% Bacuchiol. Um, and I will put a moisturizer on over it if my skin is feeling or looking dry. Um, lately, that's been less less of the case, um, which I'm happy about, but I do finish with our eye cream from the, the Resist Anti-Aging Eye Cream that gets dabbed on, um, and I do put the Retinol Bacuchiol product around my eye area uh, up to the orbital bone. Um, and yeah, I, I certainly haven't noticed any uh, reduced efficacy uh, layering the eye cream on top of that. Joan says, hi, I recently had to have surgery on my hand. Any suggestions for helping uh, to, I'm a, to the scar? Uh, so you're looking for, for scar reduction. <clears throat> well, first and foremost, keep it protected from sun exposure as much as possible. Uh, even if that means wearing a glove while driving. Uh, nowadays, I'm seeing a lot more people wear gloves anyway, just because they're worried about the virus. Um, 
so you certainly fit right in there. I wouldn't worry about walking around with a glove and having people look at you strange. It's just we're not in that we're not in that space and time anymore. It's like anything goes. Um, barring that, if you don't want to put something over your hand or maybe your your recovery is such that um, that is impractical, uh, do at least try to protect any exposed areas with a good sunscreen, SPF 30 or greater. It does not need to be a special sunscreen for the hands. They're out there, um, but any sunscreen that feels good to you will, will do. If it's got the SPF 30, if it says broad spectrum, which is what you want, uh, it doesn't matter if it also says face, body, hand, foot, whatever. Uh, what you want is the sun protection. So along with that, I would also look at um, applying a vitamin C uh, type treatment that has a higher level of that ingredient. There's various options from brands like The Ordinary. If you're just looking for a straight basic vitamin C that isn't too expensive, uh, the Inky List has options. They have a really good one with ascorbyl glucoside uh, that's a nice lightweight gel texture and cost about $15. Again, overall, it's a, it's a bit on the more basic side, but if, if what, you, what, what we're talking about here is individual ingredients and the impact that they can have. Uh, but generally speaking, as skin is healing, uh, anything you do that keeps it protected from moisture loss, from injury, from excess inflammation is good. So as a general rule, the more antioxidants you can put on that area as your skin is healing, the better. Um, those would be the, the, the primaries. Um, understand that uh, scars can take up to two years to, to fully form. Uh, and, and kind of get to the point where this is how they're going to look, you know, unless you have something else done, uh, either from a dermatologist or another surgical procedure, scar reduction type procedure. Um, but it, it, the uh, anatomy or, you know, what, what goes on behind the scenes that causes uh, a scar to form is, is pretty amazing. Uh, and it's a, it, it and that happens without us thinking about it, just in terms of how skin heals. Um, trying to think if there's anything else. I mean, you could try Mederma. There's, you know, that, I think that kind of has mixed results. Um, I would rather, I would rather see you use quercetin. I think it's a very good antioxidant. Uh, that is. Mederma's active ingredient is an onion bulb extract, and the, what, the, the active component in that onion bulb is the antioxidant quercetin, because onions and garlic, for that matter, are good natural sources of that antioxidant. But even better, in my estimation, if you can find uh, a topical product that has a higher amount of quercetin. And how will you know if it's a higher amount if, um, if the um, concentration isn't revealed? The product will have color. If it's if it has quercetin in it and it, it's a white lotion or cream, not enough in there to really help the skin healing. You want a it should be like a golden yellow to light orange in color. Then you're getting a nice amount of quercetin. Um, I wish I'm not. We we had a product that was formulated around that that we had to discontinue, uh, unfortunately. But and I'm not thinking of another one. But if you go to sites like skinstore.com, dermstore.com, any of the um, more derm-oriented um, e-commerce sites and search for quercetin as an ingredient, Q-U-E-R-C-E-T-I-N, see what comes up. Just remember you want a product with color and don't buy a product in a jar because quercetin is an antioxidant. They will steadily break down with ongoing exposure to light and air. Oh, Katie is asking, what are my favorite water-resistant SPFs for the beach? I would also wear a hat. My skin is combination. Thank you. Okay. Um, I generally stick with mineral sunscreens from head to toe. I just find that they, they work best with my skin. Um, I like the... I, I don't use water-resistant... I mean, a whole lot, mostly because I'm not at the beach a whole lot. I'm not really a beach person. Um, I like walking on them, but i am you'll never find me just laying on a beach. Just not me. Um, so the MD Solar Sciences brand is the one that I, I always keep around. I They're a bit on the pricier side. 
I wish, you know, for how much you get. I wish I wish the size was better. Um, I also like the Australian Gold line of mineral sunscreens. And there, there's a few options there. Um, there's a couple of them from Australian Gold that I don't think on the label it says water resistant, but they certainly feel like they are. And if you put some on and then you like run your hand under the tap, for example, you'll see the water just kind of beads up and, and rolls right off. That's water resistant. I mean, you still need to reapply. Water resistant does not mean waterproof. Um, but, but yeah, those are my, those are my personal go-tos for when I want a heavier duty water resistant sunscreen. The nice part about those two is because they're mineral based formulas. Um, all of the MD Solar Sciences are, last I knew, um, Australian Gold does a mix of mineral and synthetic, meaning some of them are pure mineral, some are just synthetic. I don't think they combine the two, although it's interesting when you can do that. Um, I, the, but the other thing I like about the, those that I do keep around is that because they are mineral based, they're super gentle for use on your kids. Uh, and they're, they're generally kind of easy to apply to. They, they have a nice um, rub in doesn't take a lot of effort. Um, they don't leave a super gross white cast, you know, so that to me <sighs> partially justifies the cost for the MD Solar Sciences is that, is that they're just really cosmetically elegant. And I like that, you know, you're not farting around with the sunscreen outside when, well, really put it on before you go outside. But, you know, if you need to reapply, you'll be outside at some point. And then Katie also asked if clog pore skin can use the CBD milk without concern um, it depends. It depends. Uh, I, I've been able to use it and I, I consider myself to have clog prone skin. Um, as an example, I can use our CBD treatment milk and I haven't noticed any uptick in clog pores, but whenever I reintroduce our Omega Complex Serum, which I love, I love how it feels. I love the ingredients in it. I think it's just a beautiful product, but my skin disagrees. And I use that for like a week, 10 days, boop, 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 boop. I get little breakouts, um, sometimes clogged pores, sometimes an acne breakout. And I have traced it back to that because as soon as I remove it from my routine and up my BHA usage, the clogged pores don't come back. So personal experience there. They're both good formulas. Uh, I wish I could give you a definitive yes, no answer, but the, what it comes down to is experimentation. Um, the CBD, the oils in the CBD milk are all lighter weight. Um, they're either polyunsaturated or monounsaturated. They're not likely to get stuck in the pore. Um, and they, most of them have a larger molecular size. So they're not going to go past the skin's uppermost layers. They're going to form that nice, uh, hydrating, um, finish that helps prevent water loss from the lower layers of skin, keeping it really soft and smooth. Joan says, I've been using the 1% retinol booster and 20% niacinamide since my wounds were closed. Absolutely can apply niacinamide and retinol on, on, those, on those areas. And of course, facial use as well. Um, niacinamide in particular is a good anti-inflammatory. It boosts ceramide synthesis in skin, uh, which, which can be import, an important part of the healing process. Um, so yeah, that's, that's great. There's no reason if you're if you have been doing so with good results. I, I still think in terms of scar reduction, if you can find a good quercetin balm or ointment, that that would be worth exploring, and you could layer that on top as your last step, uh, or maybe that's what you put on at night. You need to uh, you know test it out and see what you think about the combination. Oh, Samantha wants my opinion on slugging. <clears throat> I recently <clears throat> became aware of that, and it's so biz I think it's kind of a bizarre name for the practice. But then when I, I was think I was watching a video that um, um, James Welsh, who's fantastic, go find him on Instagram and YouTube when when this is done. Um, he was doing a video about slugging, and uh, he was explaining that the. Let me back back up a bit. Slugging involves putting a very very thick layer of a Vaseline, uh, either Vaseline itself, petroleum jelly, or a similarly thick ointment type product like CeraVe healing ointment or Aquaphor healing ointment, on your skin as a means of um, basically 
sealing everything else in that you've applied first and waking up with you know baby butt smooth skin. Uh, and it's called slugging, as he explained it, because the very shiny finish that such products leave on the skin is uh, is reminiscent of the slime trail that um, slugs leave as they you know they, they secrete that um, shiny substance that helps them move along surfaces. Apparently, that's where the name came from. When I first heard it, I'm like, slugging? Slugging is in like hitting somebody? What, what, what is that all about? Uh, you know, we've come across some strange things in the <laughs> realm of skincare. Um, so, you know, you can't blame me for jumping to that. Like, that's what slugging is, right? And they're like, no, 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 no. So, um, yeah, I, I think it can be helpful if you are dealing with dry to very dry and dehydrated skin. And... Petroleum jelly, despite its very thick, greasy texture, no research showing that it clogs pores, no research showing it worsens acne, no research showing that it suffocates skin. Uh, it, it does a very good job of preventing transepidermal water loss. It's actually, in many circles, it would be considered the gold standard. Uh, it's just saddled with a less elegant feel compared to a lot of other emollient type ingredients that would moisturize the skin. So if you are clog prone or acne prone, um, I, I don't think you have reason to be uh, worried about slugging making those issues worse, but it would really depend on what else you're putting on your skin and how oily it is because that it's that oil if that oil, if the if the um, Vaseline is keeping that oil that would normally exit your pore from spreading out the way it should, it's possible. This is theory here. It's possible that it could, you know, kind of cause it to top off um, where it's not spreading out on the skin because it can't get through that petrolatum, that uh, that petroleum jelly. So it's kind of starting to back up in the pore. There, there's maybe something to that again. I'm theorizing, um, but I suspect if you have oily skin, you're not gonna you're not looking to make your skin more moisturized. You know, if anything, you're looking to remove that excess oil uh, to keep your skin more on the normal looking and feeling side, where you're not seeing shine. You're not, you know, finding that your makeup lasts two hours before you have to touch it up, things like that. So um, the other the other consideration with slugging. <clears throat> is people, of course, you're doing this before you go to bed. I would not recommend slugging as a morning thing. You know, if you're going to follow with makeup, good luck getting an even application. Um, the other issue is just that if that thick layer of petroleum jelly, unless you are a very dedicated back sleeper, you know, and you don't toss and turn and move around that much during the night, you're going to get Vaseline on your bed linens. You just will. Um, so... If you're okay with that, great. Give it a try. And you have dry skin, give it a try. It's not going to hurt. That's for sure. It's, I mean, for, of all of the skin trends that we've come across lately, I would say that that's one of the safer ones to try uh, if you have dry, dehydrated skin. Uh, and Or, uh, well, the dehydration part can uh, often occur if you live in an environment where the humidity is low. Uh, either all the time or uh, seasonally. That's exactly what's going on here in Michigan right now. The relative humidity indoors is is vanishingly low compared to like what it is in the summer months. Um, so, well, what the heck, I might try slugging tonight. All right, let's do a couple other questions. Uh, Relind says, hi, Brian, I hope you're well. I have small closed comedones on my jawline. They always come back. An esthetician that was treating my skin told me it was because of consuming milk. Could that be true? There is research tying the hormones in milk to acne in some people. Um, stopping dairy, it's not just milk, it's, it's, it's anything made from milk. Uh, and it doesn't matter if it's Grass-fed cows, it doesn't matter if it's organic milk, it doesn't matter if they're not grazing on anything with pesticides, and on and on and on. Uh, no, ma no matter how clean and pure the milk is and how the cow cows are raised, cow milk naturally has um, hormones in it. 
It just does. Um, so that is believed to be the trigger for some people. I haven't seen any literature personally that has looked at dairy products and clogged pores. It's always been about acne, but it's possible that those studies looking at acne were counting closed comedones as acne. You know, they were kind of putting that type of a breakout under the acne umbrella. Um, so the one thing to do, cut out dairy. Do it, and I would say do it for at least two weeks, uh, preferably a month, and see how your skin change. If nothing changes, you know, and you're still kind of working with like BHA exfoliants and whatnot to get those those clogged areas under control and you don't see any change, I wouldn't blame the dairy, particularly if you enjoy it, you know, anything in moderation. Um, but that's the only way to know for sure. All right, one more question. Oh, let's pick a poor question. Um, oh, Blonde Pictures says, how often do you receive facials? Should it be once every season or more? I have never had a facial done. Ever. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not um, saying that facials aren't worth it. Um, a lot of them aren't though. Uh, I think the only valuable part of a facial in terms of skin improvement is the extractions that a good esthetician can do. Um, and, but when I have certain light emitting procedures or a peel done in that type of a medical setting, the person doing the procedure always does extractions as just part of the process. So whereas a facial tends to involve steaming, facial massage, a series of masks are applied, and then as a finishing step, they may put a um, treatment serum on you. Maybe they have some sort of device that is said to infuse the product further into your skin. Uh, I don't think such things are really necessary or all that helpful, but, um, the take home message is you do not need to get regular facials to have good skin. What you do at home on a daily basis is much more important than what you may have done uh, in the, in the uh, purview of a facial once a month, once every other month. I do think depending on skin concerns, uh, signs of aging, clogged pores, that getting uh, routine facial peels and there's a whole you know, there's like a whole big menu of them out there, different acids, different concentrations, different blends. And there, there isn't necessarily one that is heads and tails above the other. I mentioned earlier that when it came to improvement in pore size, that glycolic acid peels uh, had some decent research behind them. So uh, that's a consideration too. I would rather spend my money on that type of a procedure or treatment than a standard issue facial. Um, and I think, I think you'd be happier with that as, as well. If you were going for a facial for the pampering experience and you enjoy, and you enjoy that and it's an occasional indulgence, spa day with the girls, whatever, great, do it. Just make sure that they're not overloading your skin with fragrant, irritating products, uh, you, you know, and you, that, which may require speaking up. And it could be just as simple at the start of the facial as saying, um, I have sensitive skin. I do not want you to use any fragrant items on me, including essential oils. That's all you have to say. And, and a good esthetician should be like, no problem. I have products, products I can use that do not have any uh, scent to them, and I think you'll be really happy. All right, one more question. I was going to grab one about pores. Alice asks, do you think extracting your pores more frequently can facilitate your skin needing to be more extracted frequently? I wonder if it becomes sort of a vicious cycle. I have wondered that too. And thank you for that question, Alex or Alice. That is, uh, that's a very good one to to end this this particular show. I I don't I don't know. <clears throat> um, I I think it dep I think it's more of an individual response. <clears throat> um, when I have had it, when I've had extractions done, like around my nose, the sides, and kind of like right through here. Um, I've noticed in the aftermath that those pores take quite some time to kind of get back to their normal size. Their normal size when they start getting filled up again and are ready to be extracted again. So I, I would think in like just again I'm speaking anecdotally here because I really can't point to any research that says you know yes Alice that's exactly what happens. It is a vicious cycle. Um, 
from my personal experience, though, I have not seen, I've not found that to be true. Um, and I, nor have I found that extractions, um, you know, like, like the, at the base of the pore, they're kind of like, aha, I'm going to produce even stickier, thicker, goofier oil, and it's going to give you the worst clog of your life. Um, that's not what happens either. It just kind of just seems to go back to normal. Uh, and then I notice that my pores, you know, as soon as they, they start gradually filling up again, uh, and, and this is with me routinely using a BHA exfoliant. and I can only imagine what it would be like if I didn't. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, I just, I, I would have to say just from my personal experience and understanding of skin physiology that, that, um, it would be more helpful than harmful. And the, the trick is to not do it too often because going in for extractions too often, uh, there, there is no question that depending on the stubbornness of what's in the pore, the manipulation that the esthetician needs to do uh, isn't necessarily the best for skin, uh, but nor is leaving all of that goop inside the pore when they can relatively quickly expel it. Um, but again, something you don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't tell somebody to go in and have extractions done every week, but just as an example, unless they're just super, super clogged. Uh, and they need that frequency, but that's again an individual response. So on that note, I will be back in two more weeks with an all-new topic. Um, oh, I just had it. Now I'm not remembering. Hopefully you'll like it though, and hopefully you like this show, and you'll come back for more, and I will check over the next week in the comment section for this video if you have any follow-up questions, or if I did not get to your question during this hour, uh, you're welcome to leave it there. I will respond, I promise. Um, just, just leave it in the comment section. But until next time, guys, thank you so much and take care.